So good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this school. It's, uh, it's great to be presenting here. And uh, as it was just said, I'm uh, part of the uh, group that's working on the Prisca project uh, that Dr. Lopinto just mentioned from the Institute of Bioeconomy of the National Research Council of Italy. And the work that we'll present today is actually a concertated group effort from all the people that worked on the project, not just me, uh, colleagues from the uh, National Research Council, from the Italian Space Agency, and from the University of uh, Milan Bicocca, which I thank for their effort and for the possibility for me to present all these uh, results. So I won't say anything more on PRISMA because we just heard a very excellent presentation about what PRISMA is and what it can do. And I'll go directly to the Prisca project. Um, as Dr. Lupinto already said, uh, the Prisca project is actually a supporting project that's going to support uh, Prisma post-launch radiometric calibration, and it helps in guaranteeing and evaluating the system and the processing chain performance. For the project, we have 12 uh, fiducia reference sites that has been selected across the whole of Italy and they span quite different land uses and uh, surface types and even water types. Uh, and they've been selected in order to be able to evaluate the performance of Prisma data on very different land use that have different uh, uh, surface characteristics and therefore different reflectance uh, response. Uh, the sites are shown here in the picture and they involve basically uh, cropland soils and agricultural sites, arborea, Braccagni, Tavoliere delle Puglie, and Yolanda di Savoia. There are some uh, inland water sites, Garda Lake and Trasimeno Lake, uh, coastal waters uh, off the shores of Venice and of Sicily in Lampedusa, and uh, we have a forest site in Lavarone, and finally we have two um, snow sites on glaciers and high mountains in Tornion and Protorosa. The people involved in the Prisca project are actually doing sampling on elementary sampling units over time, uh, in tandem with the PRISMA overpass on the same time, on the same moment. The ESUs are our uh, elementary sampling unit. It's our basic unit of measurements and of sampling. And generally, ideally, our ESUs should be three by three PRISMA pixels in order to be sure to have a pure single centered uh, PRISMA pixel in the acquisition area. But if the surface is not big enough, the field on which we're sampling is not big enough, this can be reduced to a two by two. And inside that area, we are taking multiple measurements to take in account the hyperlocal variability of the surface reflectance. The ESU is kept at least 50 meters from any field edge or surface discontinuity in order to avoid having in the prisma pixel that we're going to analyze um, to minimize the effect of uh, spectral mixing or a deescency effect where uh, radiance from a um, surface that is not part of the ESU, ESU is actually uh, reflected back. Mm -hmm to the sensor and the measurements are taken with the portable spectral radiometer, as you can see here in the image, which is uh, repeatedly white reference to be as representative as possible of the surface uh, reflectance. One of the main endpoints of this measurement that we're taking on the ESU is actually the comparison of the PRISMA level two data, the bottom of atmosphere reflectance that has been produced by the atmospheric correction procedure uh, on the ASI side with the uh, bottom of atmosphere reflectance that we are measuring on the field. Uh, given that there are differences, of course, in the spectral resolution between the two sensors, the handheld spectrometers and PRISMA, we are processing the data by doing a spectral sampling from the field to PRISMA. We're cleaning the spectra where we have the extremely noisy H2 absorption regions, and then we're doing an average of the ESU signatures as well as the uh, PRISMA pixels in order to have a um, standard deviation that accounts for local variability. This is a first example, and I will show you many examples on this, of what a comparison between uh, PRISMA and the ground sampling data looks like. Uh, we have in blue the average and the standard deviation of the PRISMA data, and in black uh, the ground data. Um, in the top row, you have in the x-axis the wavelength at which we're measuring, and in the y-axis the reflectance expressed as a percentage. 
In the bottom row, instead, we in the y-axis, you have the reflectance difference, again, in percentage between prisma and the ground sampling. These are alfalfa fields measured across the agricultural sites that I showed you before. And as you can see, prisma is quite good. He can follow quite well both the magnitude and the trend of reflectance across the whole spectrum. And it's, it's well contained within the, uh, the minus five plus five percent difference that we given us a threshold, which are the red dashed lines that you can see in the plot below, with only some exceptions in the furthermost part of the sphere, where we have a um, certain drop in, in the reflectance signal over here and some scattered, uh, generally scattered uh, spikes that, um, that are due to a salt of noise that you can see around here at the 1000 nanometer, but the performance is generally pretty good. This is confirmed, for example, even on grassland sites, again, from the uh, agricultural sites that I showed you before, these are from grasslands in here. The performance is even better probably also because even for the ground data, the homogeneity of a grassland is uh, way smoother than what you can find in an alfalfa field that tends to have more hyperlocal uh, variability. Beside uh, vegetation, we also work on different kinds of surfaces, such as uh, non-photosynthetic vegetation, which is a particularly important topic for agriculture, uh, for stubble and for mood vegetation. And you can see here as well that while there is a little bit more of noise, the performance is still, still pretty good. We also work on bare soils. The bare soils are, are a lower reflecting surface compared with uh, vegetation and even NPV, and it's harder to extract a good reflectance signals on such uh, low reflecting targets. And here you can see that while the performance is still good, there is a greater offset between the, um, the, the sampled data in situ and the satellite uh, measured data, especially again in the sphere and in a certain part of the visible and, and, and uh, a little bit of noise in the near infrared, but this is due to the low reflectance of the surface target and the complexity of the surface target. We have measured also waters. I won't spend much time into waters though, because there will be a lecture tomorrow from Dr. Claudio Giardino, which will go in depth, not only on Prisma, but in general on the hyperspectral measurement of water. So I'll just show you here briefly some results. Water is a complex surface as per the bare soils. It's a low reflecting surface, having also some issues with glint and other, and other complexities. So here we see that actually the magnitude of the reflectance over water tend to be uh, within the magnitude of the difference that we give an assertive threshold. So uh, we are going toward the limit of what our, uh, the performance metrics that I calculated for this land use is, but we see that we have um, var different variable performances. In some cases, we have pretty good. In some other cases, there is a certain offset between the measurement and the data. And this is true for both inland waters and coastal waters where we see a specific tails of the Prisma uh, sensor in the blue. Here, I want to show you uh, the last two surface that we measured within, uh, not the last two, but the last two in this presentation that are within the Prisca project, a limestone, a mineral surface, and the snow on Plateau Rosa. The limestone is on the left and the snow is on the right. On the limestone, you can see an additional line, the magenta line, which is um, an ad hoc atmospheric correction. And the investigator here started from the level one uh, at sensor radiance Prisma data and did um, perform an ad hoc correction for this specific site. And you can see that the performance, even in the blue and in the sphere, gets better. Uh, this is, and this is true, and this is especially important also for water, is what uh, Dr. Ropinto was saying before. Sometimes the problem with the performance is not on the Prisma data. The Prisma data that are acquired on the satellite side are pretty good but uh, atmospheric correction is a complex process and on certain surfaces it might need some adjustment to actually yield uh, a good bottom of atmosphere uh, reflectance but the data are there and, and they are good. Uh, snow is a very high reflecting surface uh, if we compare it for example with bare soil we have bottom of atmosphere reflectance that peaks at around 80 percent and we can see that 
the correlation, the, the, the comparison between Prisma and ground is, is pretty good with very few um, peaks that are going below or above the 5% threshold. This table sums up a little bit of what I said before. So you, if you check the average R squared um, metric for the whole, uh, for the average of the whole, uh, on the whole land uses, you can see that Prisma does a pretty good job almost everywhere. The only issues, uh, as uh, Dr. Lopinto mentioned before, and what I show you uh, now is on the low reflecting surfaces, such with low reflecting surfaces, such as water, and um, bare soil in water is also particularly complex to measure uh, a direct, an absolute difference in, uh, in reflectance. And this is um, make, it's possible to make this thing better by doing specific atmospheric correction of the data for these particular surfaces. The L1 data that I didn't show here in details uh, still do a pretty good job of representing uh, the surface radiance. Uh, the, we did, these are the ESUs that are generally sampled on the ground uh, with this handheld portable uh, spectral radiometer. And these are generally measured when there is a Prisma overpass in a time span that goes from one hour before up to one hour after uh, the Prisma overpass on that specific site. But as you've seen from the protocol, we need to take multiple measurements within the ESUs to get a representative uh, reflectance information from the surface. And, some, and sometimes these ESUs are actually quite distant one from the other. So in two hours, you can actually cover not that much uh, ESUs because you need to move from one to other and take multiple measurements. So uh, we have a limited spatial extent that we can uh, assess by doing ground sampling. Uh, fortunately, as uh, Dr. Lopinto showed before, there are, there are interesting um, collaborations between the Italian Space Agency, the European Space Agency, uh, DLR and, uh, and NASA. And uh, we were able to obtain also some airborne data from the Aviris next generation uh, hyperspectral uh, radiometer that was flown on some of the Priscav site. This is uh, particularly important because it allows us to extend the, the spatial information that we can get beside the ground sampling and also because uh, the aircraft needs atmospheric correction so it helps us to understand what's the impact of atmospheric correction on the retrieve reflectance but the aircraft having a higher uh, spatial resolution and being closer to the ground is actually more coupled with the measurement that we are able to take on the ground and uh, for specific spatial resolution is also for example possible to use tarps reference tarps that help us in constraining the atmospheric correction of the aircraft data and yielding even more uh, high quality information when compared to the in situ measurements. These are the sites where we had the flights from Aviris. Um, there are two water sites, one in land at the Trasimeno Lake, one coastal water sites, it's Venice, and uh, two uh, agricultural sites, the Braccagni site in Tuscany and the Yolanda di Savoia in the northern part of Italy in the province of Ferrara. As you can see from the table in the bottom left corner here, Braccagni was the only site where it was possible to have a, a simultaneous flight of Aviris and the Prisma overpass on the same day, while for the other side there was a slight uh, time delay between uh, the Aviris flight and, and the Prisma overpass. Uh, to do comparison uh, with Aviris, we actually extended our methodology a little bit and we made some distinction from side to side. In Bracagna, where we had the simultaneous acquisition, we tried to keep this comparison as close as possible with what we were doing in the ground sampling, with the in situ sampling. And so we compared the Prisma uh, bottom of atmosphere reflectance with the Aviris reflectance as is. We just did spectral sampling. For Yolanda di Savoia, we actually Beside this step, it was added another step where the Prisma L2D data was uh, smoothed following the procedure from uh, Julia Tagliabue and colleagues, Dr. Tagliabue and colleagues. And uh, also the Aviris data was uh, smoothed with a Savitsky-Golai filter. 
On Trasimeno Lake and Venice Lagoon, a much more processing was done, and actually the comparison was not made only between Aviris and Prisma, but it was also possible to obtain comparison with, with other sensors that were um, acquiring on the area of interest, uh, like Sentinel-2, Sentinel-3, and TESIS, which is the hyperspectral instrument on board of the International Space Station. Uh, in Trasimeno Lake, the PRISMA data were uh, compared after an atmospheric correction of the level one, and in both the Trasimeno Lake and Venice Lagoon, it was also possible to have in situ data to run the comparison between the various sensors. These are the agricultural sites. Uh, we have uh, Bracagni and Yolanda di Savoia, and they are um, have shared some uh, some uh, land uses. Some some crop types are are common between the two, and that's where we focused mainly our our comparison. And in the case of Bracagni, where we had uh, simultaneous acquisition between Aviris and Prisma, we actually used the same approach to the ESUs. We made some, uh, let's say, synthetic ESUs, uh, three by three Prisma pixels wide. While in Yolanda di Savoia, given that we didn't have the simultaneous acquisition, we made our statistical uh, sample a little bit more robust by actually taking uh, averages over the whole uh, land uses that we had available. Um, the area is uh, slightly different between uh, Bracagni and Yolanda di Savoia. You can see that the second is uh, as a bigger is a bigger surface compared with the uh, with the area of interest where we had the flight in, in Bracagni. This is the first comparison between Aviris and Prisma. This is again on uh, Bracagni in Tuscany. In the title of the plots, you can see the different land uses that we have compared. And the, um, in the red, you have the Aviris data, and in blue, you have the Prisma data. Again, you can see that while there is a slight underestimation between uh, of Aviris over Prisma, of uh, Prisma over Aviris, sorry, uh, and there's still this sawtooth uh, noise patterns in the red edge and in the near, the Prisma data are pretty good. They are well performing in the trend compared with the aircraft data, and also the magnitude is good. And this is quite visible if we actually run scatter plots over the whole uh, uh, of the over the various land use. And you can see that the satellite data and the aircraft data have an excellent correlation with R square above zero eight for all the land uses, and root mean square error and mean absolute error that are quite I quite actually small in comparison with the, with the reflectance magnitude that we were measuring on, on the site. For Yolanda di Savoia, we have a similar uh, outcome, but here we have an additional uh, line in the plots. The green line, I'm sorry if it's um, too light, but it's, I hope you can see it, but the, the green line is actually the one that has the Prisma data that has been smoothed following the procedure from Dr. Tayebu and colleagues. And you can see that the sawtooth noise that we were seeing in the in the around the 1000 nanometer in the in the near is actually way, way less impacting now. And uh, and and the trends are good as the correlations are. If we check the correlation, we have in uh, in magenta. Uh, the magenta dots are actually the Prisma raw data, as is, and the blue dots are uh, Prisma after this smoothing. And you can see that the smoothing actually, the, the correlation is pretty good everywhere, even in the raw data. We have R square that are above 0 0.9 in this case. And the um, smoothing actually makes a better correlation, improves the correlation a little bit without impacting significantly the root mean square error and the mean absolute error of, of the data. This again is an overall comparison that was shown already in the previous presentation of the Aviris versus, uh, versus uh, Prisma. It's taken a whole, a whole average over the different agricultural sites. So we have an overall average of Bracagni in blue, an overall average for Yolanda di Savoia in magenta, and an overall average of Yolanda after the smoothing procedure in green. And as you can see, if the smoothing procedure is applied, you actually obtain an excellent uh, performance of, of Prisma with uh, 
with which is well contained within the plus minus five percent uh, difference that was taken as a mission requirement for this kind of comparison. We are going to move now to the water sites. And again, here is a, I will try to sum it up because it's a lot of lines, a lot of plot and lots of different stations that were measured across the lake. And uh, um, I think it's, we can focus only on the red line that is the in situ data, the dark blue line, which is the Averis data, and then the light uh, blue line that is actually the Prisma data, the Prisma reflectance. And you can see these lines are actually following the trend pretty good. We have again some issue in the blue, as we've seen in the ground sampling that's related to the atmospheric correction. But if we look at the air square for Prisma, it's we are actually going having a very good uh, a very good correlation with the data that are have, have been actually taken in, in C2, which is quite comparable with the correlation coefficient that Averis had with the in situ data. Again, the root mean square error are, even if the reflectance here is small, so compared to the magnitude reflectance, uh, the magnitude of the reflectance are a little bit higher than on the land side, but they're still, they're still contained. Here with- Nico, yes? uh, you have five more minutes. Sure, we're I'm almost done. I'm actually at my last slides. We're, we are, we're just seeing some correlation between the in-situ data and PRISMA for different wavelengths. And we've seen what we've mentioned before. So the correlation is a little bit worse in the, in the blue wavelength due to these atmospheric issues. And it gets generally better going toward the red. A similar, a similar behavior is visible in, uh, in the coastal waters. The air square are a little bit uh, worse, but coastal water are even more uh, lower reflecting than inland waters. And overall, the correlation follow the same trend. So the conclusion is that after a couple of years of uh, samplings and of comparison between the Prisma data and the Fiducia reference site, we've seen a, a very good, a very good results. So the Prisma data are pretty good in comparison with the in situ data. We have some exceptions where we have. Uh, dips in reflectance, so low reflectance signal, or where we have uh, surfaces that are particularly complex from the point of view of the atmospheric correction. But these um, issues are partially resolvable at, or almost completely resolvable with ad hoc atmospheric correction and the smoothing for the noise in the, in the, in the far part of the red and in the near infrared. So, uh, the fiducia reference measurements are ongoing, the Prisca project is ongoing, but we are quite satisfied up until now with what we, with the comparison that we've made and with the quality of the Prisma data that we've seen up until now.